In this video we will talk about the top 40 of my good episodes ranking. We have many episodes from season 4 and 3 in this ranking, 2 from season 1 and only one particular juicy from season 2. So let's dive right into my number 40. Now to one moment everyone waited for in the last season, in Meteor Emily is finally seeing her dad again. I must admit the overall plot of this episode was not my taste, really too designed. I mean why would David trying to kill Emily? Was it not a bit extreme to go this far again to protect Victoria? I mean he could for starters try to intimidate her. I mean after all he does not know Emily and what she is capable of. He only has the word of Victoria. Maybe this was just a harmless fight between two socialites for all he knows. Look at the fight between Victoria and Lydia in season 1. Anyway, this had to be on the list more because of the two scenes with Emily and David and Nolan and Jack. I really loved that every one of the revenge gang got their moment of realization. And here it comes in handy that Jack is a cop and the first to recognize David. I really loved how they built the tension here with him trying to warn Emily. Because this must have been a great shock. Then I need to speak with Emily for a minute. Alone. What, are you forgetting protocol? You prepped the lineup, you can't speak to the witness in private. A first year law student have that ID tossed to trial. Come on, you talk to her after. And I like that they go full in with all these questions coming up and refueling the hate for Victoria because of her stunt at the press conference. Those were really the strongest scenes from season four. Is this possible? It was no. him, Nolan. In my house last night, it had to have been, but why, why would he break into my house? Why would he want to hurt me? I don't know, I, I don't know. What the hell, man, is this real? It is. Mrs. Grayson, it seems your family can't escape the ghosts of the past. Charlotte and I are focused on the future and getting to know David once again. David has been through a, a horrific experience at the hands of my late ex-husband, Conrad Grayson, who was an evil, evil man. We asked for privacy at this moment so that David could readjust and to be with loved ones and his family. It's all the questions for now. What just happened? She got to him first. Quick score check. We have the conclusion of David and Victoria's story arch with him going out in the open and telling his story. Again soapy elements with Victoria trying to control the situation and David covering up his lies. A shocking plot twist for Emily getting to know her father is still alive. I admit the next episodes are purely on this list because of the fashion and optics. I really love this fairy tale scene with Emily's and Daniel's wedding photoshoot. And in fact, this dress was far better than her real wedding dress. Yet I get it with her plan she cannot have such a lush dress with that much fabric. She would have sunken like a stone. Big smiles. Yeah, that's nice looking at each other. That Lulier fits you impeccably, Emily, like it was made for you. And the masquerade ball was creepy in a shameless typical filler episode, but I loved the theatrics here with the Mozart song Requiem and Victoria losing her conscious. But let's dive into Surrender first. As I said before I love those episodes when they bring fan favorites back like here with Amber Valletta. Lydia is just such a nasty and fun character. You didn't save me. You got rid of me. Oh, Victoria. Still so damn good at pointing that finger of yours. Maybe I'll go easy on you. I think besides Emily she is the only one who can keep up with Victoria. The only thing that really bothered me was that they bring this dull plot with the photograph back. I honestly don't have time for this right now. Funny that you should say that, because there's nothing honest about you. And I can finally prove it. And there you are, Emily. Looks just like you, but with a billion fewer dollars. I get it is a true threat for Emily, but playing it down because neither Lydia nor Victoria know her true identity belittles this threat in season 3. I mean Victoria already assumes Emily is a grifter and wants to marry Daniel for all the wrong reasons. And Emily really gives not the impression of a loving and doting wife in both seasons. Daniel might be too much in love to see it but for everyone else it is clear to see that Emily is not head over heels for Daniel anymore. Daniel can tell you're faking it because with him. I can't stand to be around him. If you want to pull this off, you're gonna have to get past that. So, who cares about this 10 year old photo of Emily showing she was not so rich before she came back to the Hamptons. And as I said before I really disliked the pregnancy lie. We need to talk. Me first. This wasn't planned. We're pregnant. For me, even Daniel shooting her was not enough appreciation of how wrong she is in pulling that card. 
As much as I hate to say it I really can understand Victoria's point of view and loved the fighting scene with her and Daniel. He is just so deep in Emily's grip and it is almost hurting to see how Daniel sees no other way out than to pull through with this wedding. On what possible reason could she have? To make certain that you marry her and not leave her Sarah. Listen to me, she is a con artist. She is going to be my wife, whether you like it or not. This time tomorrow, Emily and I will be married. You lost. Okay, it's over. Think about if Emily would have really wanted to marry him and have kids with that man. What would their future life be? I mean even if she got pregnant to hide her lie after the wedding. He is clearly not that much in love with her anymore. Daniel even begins to despise her because he finally sees the similarities between Emily and his mother. Oh, I don't think I can go through with this wedding. And it took until today to realize that Emily and my mother are the same person and I do not want to marry my mother. And Emily despises him because of the same reason. He is becoming more and more like his father Conrad. So this wedding was doomed from the start. Quick score check again. We have soap opera and dressing up all over the place with that wedding photo shoot. And we have a plot twist with Lydia coming back. So this is truly the most soapy episode of Revenge on my list. Now to the Halloween episode with the Grayson mask ball. What a great excuse for dressing up again. And I really enjoyed how Emily was torturing Victoria with the newfound details Mason told her about Victoria's past. Victoria, she has another son. This episode masquerade was really everything they promised us at the end of the previous episode. I imagine you'll exploit this fresh little morsel with your usual flair. You can't even begin to imagine. And I enjoyed the black and white theme far more than the fire and ice from the engagement party in season 1. Yeah it was a bit under the nose Victoria wearing black and Emily wearing white. But if you think that in fact it is the opposite, Victoria is the victim here and Emily appears like a female devil and femme fatale it makes totally sense. You must admit she never looked better than in this form-fitting dress. Again, the only thing that was annoying was the side plot with the love triangle between her, Daniel and Aiden and the news about Padme's death. So you and Daniel are back together? Daniel's clever. There's no turning back once you go public. We should, uh, we should take a walk outside. Padma. Though Gabriel Mann played Nolan's anger and devastation really good, but Padme's exit from the show was just so unspectacular that I did not care that much. I loved her. She did go. I loved her. She's gone. I'm not leaving you alone, Nolan. I love you too. So quick ranking check, we have some dressing up for the masquerade and the soapy element of Victoria's firstborn son that she gave up for adoption. With flashbacks of course, but this time it is the pregnant teenager Victoria. Is the baby's father still in the picture? Would you like to call your parents? I don't live with them. You have a choice ahead of you, one that's going to affect the rest of your life. For the next episode we jump back to the beginning of season 1. By the way all of the episodes of season 1 made it to this list. Which is no surprise giving it was the strongest season of revenge. Many even believed the show was better off without any of the following seasons. I strongly disagree, but let's talk about the episode Intrigue. This episode has everything we love about revenge. A love triangle between Emily Daniel and Jack, dressing up for a big party and several intrigues going on behind everybody's back. The only tiny little criticism I have is Lydia Davis. Good that she survived because she was one of the more intriguing supporting actresses. Yet I dislike the whole plot of keeping her hostage at Grayson Manor. I mean was that really the only option to keep the Graysons out of trouble? I know they have not done all the gruesome things yet. But Conrad was already responsible for blowing up a plane full of innocent people. Framing an innocent single father and killing him off. So. Having this problem what Lydia surely was for Conrad handled by his chief of security and almost kill her in the process really that bad. I mean why not just put the blame on him saying he was so loyal to his employers that he wanted to take care of Lydia by himself. It would not even have been a complete lie because he was going rogue here. I have some bad news to report. Lydia Davis just jumped off her balcony. Now to the good stuff which was Emily waking up with Daniel. Hi. How is it possible for you to wake up looking this good? It isn't. You just have a sleep. Come here, I like this gym. One of my favorite scenes with the two. I mean how beautiful is this light here? And Nolan disturbing them with that non-approving face. Just hilarious. What the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Daniel's upstairs. Bravo. Get rid of him. Speaking of love. Even though it had the vibe of a car crash going on I really loved this first love confession of Jack. It is far more fitting for him how clumsy he is telling her this. You get a boat, out on the open water, and you catch a wind, and the sails fill, and 
She comes to life under you, and it feels like more than just wind and water and vessel. It feels like there's something else, something pulling you forward and, and surrounding you at the same time. Am I making any sense? Look at how afraid he is of her reaction here. Almost seems as if he anticipates her saying no. And you really can see how hard this is for Emily. No offense to the writers, but in season one, they are just so much better in writing scenes that take actually time to process emotions. And how beautifully is the background in this scene? Almost fairy tale like and very much romantic. A great contrast to what is going on behind the scenes with Tyler and Frank. I really love the underlining theme here that Tyler is in love with Daniel. They could have even made it more explicit. But on second and third watch it really got me. The tension between Emily and him right from the start. You might want to be careful who you're dealing with. I'm always careful, but I always know who I'm dealing with. Hmm. He is not just jealous of her status, he wants her out of Daniel's bed. And the tension Frank finding out about her secret was maybe the most thrilling part of season one that really kept us invested. The only thing I hated that he had to die in order to keep her secret. I know there was no other way and Emily really should be thankful that Fomander spared her to do the job herself. Cause obviously Frank could not be bought. How much do you want? Yeah, it's always about money with you people, isn't it? I was just a kid. I'm not that girl anymore. But you know what? You can clean yourself up. But zebras don't change their stripes. One of the best quotes from the show by the way and surely so true. Now to the ranking, we have definitely flashbacks with Emily and Amanda. Some soapy cliches with Tyler and Frank. And since it is 4th of July we have a major Grayson party as an excuse to dress up. Kindred was kind of in the middle and maybe was better off on the not as bad list, but I just love the family drama around Louise and of course the wedding which in fact was not one. But let's start with what I dislike, which was just that. Why bother making such a beautiful wedding dress for Louise when there is no wedding and we hardly see anything of it? That was very much deceptive for me and my little girl inside. I also did not like this back and forth with Louise believing or not believing she killed her dad. Did you remember Louise? I didn't do it. Is there a way around murder? I said I killed him, Nolan. I get they had to fill the episode but was not enough going on with Margot Revengender, Amanda's birthday and Emily hooking up with Ben. Another problem I have with this episode. And again, we had a big fight between Emily and Jack. Only well, he didn't return my calls, so I thought I'd come by and make sure you're okay. What are you really doing here? I told you I was worried. About me? Or that I might, uh, might blow a fuse and tell one of these camera crews everything I've done? Instead of all this fighting which really appeared a very dull repetition of their fights in season 3. They could have prepared us for a relationship between the two. Who came up with the idea giving Ben a shot? Well this is unexpected. Yeah, to me too. Yeah, Emily and Nick have not the best chemistry, but we all knew they were endgame after Aiden died. So why did they not go for it from the start? The scene at the end with Jack seeing Emily and Ben making out really broke my heart, and was a shameless repetition of the scene from season 3 with Emily and Aiden kissing. I need Emily. Just Emily. And the two from season 2 when Daniel was seeing Emily and Aiden kissing only to be seen later by Aiden kissing Emily. Yet the first one was on purpose to fuel Daniel's jealousy, while Aiden instead of Victoria was not supposed to watch the renewed relationship of Daniel and Emily. And if you count Fomander as love interest in, we had in season 1 a scene when Daniel was moving in and Fomander was watching the two embrace. Anyway, now to the things that worked for me. David's birthday present and the difficulty for Emily going back to being Amanda. I know where I want to start. Your birthday, the one that I missed a few days ago. And sadly have for the last 20 years. I haven't celebrated my real birthday in well, forever. Well, maybe it's time to change that, to be Amanda again. Another favorite quote from season three was this. Because it is so true. My father seems to want me to just go back to being Amanda. But you're having a hard time letting go of Emily. See, that's the thing. I never intended to be Amanda again. There was nothing left there. I was going to clear my father's name and... And leave Emily Thorne behind, start over as someone new. And even though I did not like Ben coming up with this stupid undercover story whenever he could. When I worked undercover... Really with the undercover thing <laughs> again? <laughs> you know, examine your subconscious. Is that story not why you came to me? Let's pretend that it is. I really like their conversation here. Again, they would have worked much better as friends than this half-hearted love triangle with Jack. 
and I loved Emily's disguise to save Louise from Claremont. Anna Bishop, New York State Office of Mental Health. I'm here to do a spot check of your facility. Uh, I'd be happy to show you around. And abandon the admission desk at a secure psychiatric facility? You just failed your first test. I think she and Louise only had a handful scenes together. This one was maybe one of the best. Emily, what are you doing here? I'm bringing you back. No, I will not ruin no one's life. This is where I deserve to be. Claremont Psychiatric. There are very few people who deserve to be here, and you don't even come close. Well, I guess it's true what they say. Marry the man marries friends. Emily, thank you. Then, of course, Emily's dance with her father and telling him how happy she is in this moment. I didn't realize that I was happy until you did. <laughs> Again, a reminder that soon something terrible would happen. Final ranking. We have the conclusion of Louisa's family story arch with the plot twist of her not being responsible for her father's death. I was trying to catch a hold of him. And for the first time after season two, we have flashbacks that are not related to the David Clark conspiracy or Amanda's childhood. What did you do? In season two, it was Victoria and her teenage pregnancy. So it's kind of fitting that Louise who is that obsessed with Victoria in another sense than Emily, but quite intensely like her gets flashbacks to her childhood trauma. We have dressing up for the wedding reception. Emily looks like a doll in this nice petrol princess-like dress. I like that they go back to give her this light feminine touch she had in season 1 with Daniel. And Nolan's blazer with the skulls looks interesting. And as I said Louise has chosen a real princess dress for her wedding with the perfect color. And sadly we have this hookup of Emily and Ben. This one from the last season was again a tough choice. Because the end of this season just feels so rushed. And fourth season was really a mess. Yet I like the conclusion and this elaborate trap Victoria set up for Emily. Sure she did it not alone. Victoria set her plan in motion. She made it look like I attacked her in a parking garage. Made sure there were witnesses who would say as much to the police. She staged her penthouse to look like she was assaulted. And seasoned it liberally with her blood. The rest of which she gave to Mason to plant in my car. She altered her handwriting just enough to make her suicide note look like a good but not great forgery. Making the world believe that I was a bigger monster than she had ever been. A monster who burned the queen alive in the castle she used to own. And I must admit the best episodes in season 4 are the ones that stood for itself and had no overall arch. So Plea Before the Great Finale was one of the better episodes. In fact in Germany they aired it like the season 2 finale is one episode with the final episode. But since here is a lot going on and the finale has to be higher up this list I separated them. We had great storylines which made the episode great like David's cancer diagnosis. No, no that can't be, they said they caught it early. Well, that was based on the initial tests different tests. It's spread. It's in my brain. Stage four lymphoma. There's no more ways to fight it. Well, that's because they aren't trying hard enough. How long? How, how many years? Not years. Months. But they said maybe six months if I'm lucky. No, no I don't believe that, and neither do you. Amanda. Doctors are wrong all the time. This is one of those times. We will see specialists. We will get other opinions. I did. You don't know anything. There are clinical trials, experimental drugs. I have money to spend on this. Nolan has money to spend on this. If we have to fund our own damn lab, that is what we will do. How did you learn to fight so hard? Say it, Dad. Tell me that is what we will do. That's what we'll do. And the twist with Ben finding Victoria only to be killed before he can tell anyone. Here you can clearly see the difference between soap opera and real life. In real life he would not have gone alone and rough here. He would have told the station and another officer or detective would have come with him. He might even would have called for reinforcement when he suspected something was going wrong here. Instead they used this moment to kill him off which was just cruel. Ben should have not died for his bad taste in women. And with Emily blaming herself for his death, they just repeat the same pattern from the previous season with the much more sad death of Aiden. I should have given everything up, but I couldn't. I, I couldn't. I brought him back and all He was gone. This is my fault. Ben is dead. He was murdered. It's my fault. Yet I liked that Nolan made such a fuss of Ben's death when he confronted Margot in the finale. What? It's no use, Margot. You can't escape this. I have proof. You hired the mercenary that murdered Ben. You crossed a line and you know it! You took a life! But if he had done the right thing instead of going on a mission in his own, Emily could have been exonerated in no time.
she had not to break out of prison in that insane way. I mean it was kind of fun seeing Nolan and Jack still standing by her side. But this prison break was really unnecessary. You know, I have the most distinct sensation of deja vu. Thanks for being here. Wouldn't be anywhere else. Yet touching was the stuff with David and that his cancer takes him away from Emily again. Many see that as kind of punishment or betrayal. But I see it as it is cruel life. At least they had one good year and David got to see his grown-up daughter. Helping her put revenge behind and life a happy life with the man he maybe always wished to be his daughter's husband. Anyway it was not the best episode of season 4 but also not the worst, so a place in the middle is fair considering the score. We have two red sharpies for the story. And two for my soapy meter. One for soap opera cliches and plot twists involved. So an average rating for the good episodes. Now back to season 1 and Emily's second target after Lydia. Bill Harmon was not that bad but surely the most typical prototype of Emily's targets. Grayson's gone soft over the years. I still believe in making big trades when it's warranted. Now's the time you should be taking some calculated risks. These are real returns of our top tier investors of the last five years. Now that's double digit gains across the board. A wall sweet crook who made millions after leaving Grayson Global. The only thing thrilling about his backstory in the episode Trust was that he was supposed to be David's best friend. Financial advisor Bill Harmon took the stand with searing testimony against his longtime friend and colleague David Clark. By the way I like how they combine the title and the prologue with the most fatal flaw of Amanda's father. He is far too trusting. Telling anyone about his affair and plans with Victoria was a big mistake. Bill Harmon knows about us. I think he's going to tell Conrad. How did this happen? I trusted the wrong person. And here we see for the first time what was so intriguing by watching the show. Episode by episode we get to see new details of the conspiracy and how David's life went down. The flashbacks combined with these great songs were just the best part of season 1 and something I missed in the later seasons. Speaking of intriguing we had many intriguing firsts in this episode. Emily and Daniel's first date and kiss. I had a really good time tonight. Me too. Good night. Good night. A first encounter with Victoria over tea. I'm curious what else we have in common. What are some of your other interests? History, for one, I'm practically obsessed with it. Art conservation is another one of my passions. Nolan helping Emily for the first time with one of her targets. Bill Harmon. What do you need me to do? You just get it. Now go. And Victoria using Frank to investigate Emily for the first time. No romantic scandals or divorces. Nothing stateside. There's a few stones left unturned. I don't expect much. Why are you so interested in this girl anyway? Because she's interested in my son. I'm not interested in what she's not. I want to know who she is. I am torn with Daniel playing polo. On some kind I like that they are trying to establish a certain lifestyle here. But in the first couple of episodes they kind of going a bit too far with the cliches here. Okay polo is a game for the rich and Daniel is still in college so he is most likely playing polo in a university team. Yet Emily stalking him still was some kind of creepy. Though her blue dress looks effortlessly great. And I like the big smiles. They just seem perfect for each other in the first half of season 1. So. No doubt the not-so-thrilling target was maybe due to all the other stuff Bill had to compete with. The only thing I dislike here was the still non-existing relationship of Emily and Nolan. Even worse she is using him and pretending to be his friend. You know Nolan Ross? Yes, we've been close for a long time. Bit of an odd bird, that one. I wouldn't guess he had any real friends at all, much less one as lovely as you. Nolan knows when people look at him they see dollar signs, so he's built up a few defense mechanisms. While all Nolan wants is a true friendship and be part of her revenge ender. Why is it so important for you to be a part of this? The only reason No Corp exists is because your father gave me cash from his personal account to develop it. And that's because he believed in me. I want the deed to the house. It's already in your name. Consider it a birthday gift for Amanda. Tomorrow is a big day, isn't it? So now the ranking. Since the first takedowns come as standalone episodes and with flashbacks we have two red sharpies for the story. One for the soapy elements and one for the hookup scenes with Emily and Daniel. Of course, Emily telling David finally the truth in the episode contact had to make it on the good list. And I must say the wait was worth it. The scene in which she confronts him was really great. If you had come for her, I would have known. I would have known! You could have come for me, but you didn't. You taught me to be strong and brave, but you're a coward. You could have come for me! Come! <sighs> And having Victoria almost killed was the cherry on top. 
and I really loved the scene before in the episode Ambush when Emily and David met for the first time. Because the writers just used Emily's and our disappointment of David as this changed character as story device, which was genius. He didn't even recognize me, Nolan. How could he not know who I am? And he lied to my face. All of this time, I have spent honoring his memory and he doesn't even have one of me. Who the hell is he, Nolan? Victoria said that Amanda was a little lost. I wouldn't consider her a credible witness. I know you both have a history. I mean we all hated that he did not tell Emily or even Victoria sooner about Malcolm Black and that he did all wrong when he was coming back, choosing Victoria all over again over his own daughter. I was in need my whole life. You were alive. Well, the person that you thought was your daughter suffered while I suffered. And you did nothing. Why? Please, I need to know. But that kept me engaged. They really make us feel Emily's pain again and her deception. So yeah this was a cool storyline. At first watch I must admit I hated this stuff, but with every rewatch I grew fonder of it. You can feel the tension and both actors are at their best in this scene. Another great thing was Kate Black Malcolm's daughter who tried to get an angle at David. I certainly did not like the storyline with her father, but she is a mole in the FBI was really intriguing. And Victoria returning to her old ways using every opportunity to get rid of Emily was fulfilling to watch. I trust that you'll get that in the right hands and keep mine clean. Shouldn't be a problem. And I like the connection here that indirectly she is responsible for the death of her son Daniel. If she had not sent Kate to Emily all that followed would not have happened. Especially since she did it behind David's back and so put the last nail into their relationship. I mean if everything had gone according to her plan she would have been responsible for the death of his child. How could she recover from that? I sat 10 years in jail alone. What were you proving then? Or did you not know that I was innocent? Of course I knew. Where the hell were you? Quick ranking score for these two episodes. We have again a little flash forward with Victoria getting struck by lightning. Again a soap opera cliches. We have a shocking plot twist with Emily revealing herself finally to David. And an intriguing new character introduced with Kate Taylor aka Catherine Black. Of course, I had to include the episodes with Pascal LaMarchal. He may not be the best target of season 3. But he and his death surely left a big impression. So these two episodes made it on the positive list. Let's start with addiction. The first big episode with Pascal trying to pursue Victoria. Your charms won't work on me, Pascal. I cannot be bought, especially by a man whose reputation for romance is reckless. You don't know me, Pascal, or what I want. And getting played by Emily. My apologies, sir, but we just sold our last two. I'm aware that many of my news outlets thrive on scandal. I have no interest in becoming one. Well, then at least. May I? Merci. It looks like you just shot yourself in the foot. Not at all. Just changed tactics. First to the bad stuff which was Daniel's behavior in this episode. Not only he is nasty to Emily. Understandable since he is trying to get rid of her. You just have to wear red. Guess I'll be betting on black for the night. Surprised you'll be betting on anything, seeing as I left the name Grayson off the guest list. No, oh, honey, I don't need guest lists. <laughs> <laughs> or have you already forgotten the doors I opened for you? You were a nobody before me. Quite the turnout for an event hosted by a nobody. <laughs> Trust me, people are only here to see the car wreck that you've become. Once the blood is hosed off the pavement, they'll be on their way. You invited your ex? Awkward. Of course I didn't. His arrogance is unmatched. But ruining Jack's and Margot relationship just for the sake of hurting Emily's friends is just so bad. He is really taking a page out of Victoria's and Emily's playbook. Daniel, are you sure he has your best interests at heart? He's not the bad person you think he is? You don't know him. Yes, I do, Jack. We've been friends since we were ten. Which is longer than I can say for you and Emily. Maybe you're just blinded by your feelings for her. What are you talking about? Is she why you're so eager for me to take a job in Italy? Of course not. Why, why would you think something like that? Is that all? I just think it's odd that he's trying to push you to leave now that Emily's single. Daniel, stop. Don't listen to him. Another thing I do not understand is Conrad's behavior. I mean at first, he tries to derail Pascal whenever he can and even targets his daughter Margot. Now he helps this French guy to get back together with the woman he still loves. What is wrong with Conrad? Well, Pascal, come on, you and I both know you're gonna give me what I want. <sighs> Conrad, I understand you don't hear no very often. What if I got you the one thing you've always wanted, but never had? Victoria. 
but the highlight of the episode was surely the Monte Carlo themed party and Emily's very sexy red dress. I think she never wore more revealing dresses than in this season. And I loved the competition between her and Victoria over Pascal. As if Victoria would believe Emily was romantically interested in Pascal. What is going on between you and Emily Thorne? I had no idea it would take jealousy to get your attention. I am trying to help you, as I know your proclivity is to chase the first skirt that flares at you. This race between the two until the end of the season was very much entertaining. And in true typical guilty pleasure tradition, I enjoyed the soap opera and over-the-top cliches. Like this literal poker game between Emily and Victoria. Oh, Emily, I'm afraid you'll have to fold. You don't have enough to match the bet. I think Daniel's engagement ring should be enough to cover it. You've been bluffing since you set foot in the Hamptons. Why stop now? Well, maybe I like to try to throw you off your game. For once, she wins legitimately. And Pascal using a model of the Eiffel Tower as recording device. Not very original, but fun to watch anyway. Pascal, I feel that I've put a considerable amount of energy into getting your attention. And now that I have it, I think it's your turn to get mine. And bringing Aiden back was another plus for the episode. Quick ranking. We have a standalone episode with Emily trying to get information from Pascal. We have the conclusion of her War of Roses with Daniel now they are divorced. They all dress up for this charity event and we definitely see soapy elements again. But no shocking plot twist and no interesting hookups. Since Javier and Charlotte do not count for me. You're on, neighbor. Winner, 22. Wait, you won. Once I know it.